genius formula. My name is Raymond Keane, and I'm going to be the master of ceremonies for this tape series. My particular interest in genius goes back 35 years. Ever since I was at school, I've been fascinated by the great minds, and when I went to Trinity College, Cambridge, I studied the great geniuses there, especially Goethe. My particular speciality is mind sports. I hold the world record for the greatest number of books written on chess and mental combat, 85 and rising. I've been given the OBE, Order of the British Empire, by the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, for services to chess, mental sports in general, worldwide and in the UK. And I'm the organiser of World Chess Championships in London and St Petersburg in 1986 and London 1993. Four and a half years ago, it was my great good fortune to meet the man who is sitting opposite me, whom I'm about to introduce, Tony Buzan. I'd never met him before. I went to a lecture of his on the brain and thinking, and I was bowled over. Within a few minutes, I was trying to persuade him desperately to bottle what he'd said to me and redistribute it for worldwide public consumption. Never in my life before had I been bowled over quite so dramatically by a man I instantly recognised as a genius, someone I should have been studying at Cambridge. Tony has been the editor of the Journal of Mensa, the High IQ Society, but that pales in comparison with his subsequent achievements. He's written 15, I said that again, 15 worldwide blockbuster, million-copy, best-selling books on the brain and thinking. He is the supreme arbiter in the world of mental world records. He's a poet, athlete, Olympic coach in mind sports and in rowing, and the co-founder with myself of the World Memory Championship. It is my great delight, Tony, to welcome you to the tape. Ray, thank you. Before we start to delineate the programme, we want jointly and without reservation to dedicate the tape and we dedicate it to the achiever of the impossible, a multifaceted genius herself, the one and only Van, Van der North. North. <laughs> now, what is the genius formula? Our ambition in this tape is to unleash the genius in everyone. We want you, when you meet your friends, acquaintances, people in the office, people at work, people at play, to have the same electric feeling that I had when I first met Tony Buzan. We want your acquaintances, friends, your whole global friendship network to go away thinking, my God, what a genius. How is this going to happen? We are going to unleash that potential in you. We're going to do it as follows. We are first of all going to delineate the multiple intelligences, and there are ten of them, that every single person possesses. Next, we are going to give a catalogue of the ten greatest minds in the history of the planet, a role model group for you to venerate, be stimulated by, and ultimately emulate and surpass. People like Leonardo da Vinci, Alexander the Great, Queen Elizabeth I, Albert Einstein, and one or two other little secrets. Next, we're going to show what the characteristics of genius are. We are going to define them so you can recognise them in the great minds and see where they fit into your own personality, your own profile, whether you need to develop them, improve them, enhance them, but above all, know what they are. After that, we're going to explain the left and right brain matrix, very important for patterning your life, and after that, we're going to introduce a wonderful little friend, one that we all have, the brain cell. Next, we're going to come to that vitally important ingredient of genius, memory. You can't get by without it. Memory liberates. It gives freedom. Without memory, you can achieve absolutely nothing. Think of the actor on the stage who can't memorise the lines. Interpretation? Forget it. Just grovelling to stay on one place. The concert pianist, the great performer, they can't memorise the music. They're shackled just to repeating what's in front of them. Without memory, you cannot create. Next, we're going to show you creativity red in tooth and claw. And now it's time for Tony Buzan, the inventor of mind maps, radiant thinking, the concept of mental literacy, and the world record holder in creativity IQ, to launch us on an exploration of the multiple intelligences. So, Tony, before we go into the ten geniuses, tell us what intelligence and genius really are. 
Yes, I'd be delighted. In fact, uh, probably useful to start off by talking about what people actually think genius is and think creativity is and think intelligence is. Uh, if you think about the normal picture of the prodigy child, you've got a 12-year-old child, and what does one actually think that child looks like? Oh, dear. <laughs> Precisely. I mean, I have now travelled around the world, and I have asked every basic culture, 50 different language groups, what do they think a prodigy child is? And the picture, the standard picture is, and you who are listening can think of, what do you think the standard picture is? And this is the standard picture. It is a child with very thick glasses, a very pallid and pale complexion, a bent and hunched posture, a person who is totally unathletic, completely antisocial, the, the stereotypical nerd. Now, you then say, right, so that's intelligence wrapped up. What do you think is the average picture of the creative genius? This is the super creative person. And what people picture there is someone who has basically no memory, who is completely disorganized, who is scruffy, unkempt, and basically spaced out. So that's creativity nicely wrapped up. And then you have uh, the interesting question, would anybody care to comment on the intelligence of the athlete? And the response is usually, har, har, har. You know, what intelligence? And in these tapes, what we're going to find out is that those stereotypes of genius, of creativity, of athleticness and physical fitness are perhaps the opposite of what is really true. So how many different types of intelligence are there? Well, in the early part of this century, intelligence was first investigated, and it was a, a chap called Binet. Now, many people think that intelligence IQ was devised by these wicked scientists who were trying to control the intelligence of the planet. In fact, it was, again, exactly the opposite. What Binet was trying to do was to make sure that children who had good intellects would be allowed a further education. In France at that time, he had observed that every child who went to university was either from the aristocracy or from the wealthy classes. And so he tried to devise tests, and he took things like verbal intelligence, uh, numerical intelligence, and he tested children. He averaged the scores. He found out which children had done better and which had done worse. And he devised this little scale. So if a child of six was acting with the verbal and numerical skills of a child of eight, that child would have an IQ higher than 100, which was the norm. So IQ basically started as the investigation of children's academic skills to see how they ranked against each other. And if they ranked higher than average, they were given greater privilege in the academic streams. So what he was really testing was just reading, writing, and arithmetic. Yeah, basically. Um, and he was testing it for the purpose of fairness and meritocracy and openness and so on. And what happened, of course, was that the IQ test then became this prison cell into which <laughs> all, all <laughs> brains were put. So, so in the last few years, we've discovered that there are many intelligences. IQ contains two of them, but there are ten prime intelligences. And another thing I'd like the listeners to do is to think as I go through the ten prime intelligences which ones they have developed strongly and which ones they haven't developed very much and already to begin to think how are they going to develop the ones which are momentarily weak and enhance the ones which are strong. Uh, something that I've always spotted with intelligence tests is that you get these, you said this straitjacket, this thing that restricts and kind of locks people in and then gives them a number, bingo, you know, you're... 102, <laughs> you're yes. 54, you're a submoron. <laughs> it's the grotesque unfairness of some of the questions that the examiner has a category of answer that he or she wants. Yes. And if you don't get that answer, you're a moron. Yes, that's and right. you must have encountered that too. <laughs> that's right. In fact, as I go through those, I'll give a couple of examples of exactly what you've said, how the child, the individual, gave a very clever answer, but because it wasn't quote-unquote correct in the context of the test, the child was considered stupid. Right. So I'll go through these ten, ten intelligences and then we can kind of examine them as we go through. Looking forward to it. Yeah, <laughs> me too. I mean, it really is exciting because this is, this is intelligence about intelligence for the listener. Now, the first one is verbal intelligence, and these are not in order of rank. These are just ten intelligences. So verbal is the first one. This, this refers to the brain's ability to know vocabulary and to know the relationships between the words in the vocabulary. So, for example, in a simple intelligence test question on the verbal IQ, 
would be something like dog is to puppy as cat is to blank. And you have to fill in, hopefully, kitten to get your, your little mark. So that's the first set of intelligences. The second one is numerical. And this is really the ability of the brain to play with the alphabet of numbers, to say, fill in the following number in the sequence, one, three, five, seven, blank. So it simply examines the ability of the brain to juggle, if you like, with the world and universe of numbers. The third one is engineering intelligence. Now, engineering intelligence... Sounds a bit bit uh, weighty, that one. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have to go and build the Eiffel Tower or something? <laughs> no. <laughs> in fact, engineering intelligence really means the ability to manipulate in your mind space. Uh -huh. That's all it means. Uh, so, for example, the surgeon has to have a high engineering intelligence developed. The standard engineer obviously has to have that intelligence developed. Uh, the person who's organising a good garden has to have that intelligence developed. Really? Really. Now, what is interesting about these first three is that they tend to be the standard intelligences that are tested. And a lot of people think that they are really weak in certain of them, especially the mathematical. Uh, again, in studies around the world, I've asked people who couldn't get a degree in mathematics. Mm. And about 90% of the hands go up because they think they can't get a degree in mathematics. Now, the reason why they think that is that at the very beginning of their little intellectual careers, they were sitting in a classroom, they were being told the basic fundaments of addition and subtraction and division, and while they were being told, they were probably daydreaming, which most young children do a lot of and should do, and I'll come to that in one of the other intelligences. So you have a poor little child who misses the basic concept of addition, and then on the test gets zero out of ten, and is mathematically intelligent enough to realize what that means, and then says, oh, so the objective evidence says, I can't do this, and from that time on, the brain blocks it out. But everybody has this numerical intelligence. You also get these horror stories. I mean, for example, I heard this story published in Sir Fred Hoyle's autobiography. Sir Fred Hoyle, of course, this fantastic astronomer who yes. should have won a Nobel Prize. And he relates this incredible story that when he was a kid just at school, six, seven years old, he was holding a flower in his hand that he could see had six petals. And the teacher said to him, it's got five, which totally contradicted the evidence of his own senses. And they got into a huge fight. <laughs> in the end, the teacher slapped him around the face and it burst his eardrum. And this sort of thing, you know, at such an early age, to be told by an authority figure that what you know to be numerically accurate is false... And you can see it. <laughs> yes. It's like being told you've got four fingers or five thumbs or something and you, you see exactly what's on your own hand. And then you get beaten up because you contradict what the authority says. And that can have a devastating effect on future numeracy. Yes, it can. Intelligence. Yeah, in fact, in fact, most children have had some horrifying experience with mathematics. In fact, I'll give you a couple of examples on the IQ test because the, the fourth intelligence, we've done verbal, we've done numerical, we've done engineering. The fourth one is creative intelligence which is a very different kind of intelligence, usually not measured. And very often, some of the standard IQ tests actually contradict creativity. Now, I've got some amusing but fundamentally very sad little examples, and they come back to what you were saying. One of them was that a little girl was, was given a test, and she was asked to cross the odd one out. And there were four little pictures. One was a picture of a spade. The next picture was a picture of a coal mine. The next picture was a picture of a pile of coal. And the third picture was a picture of a daffodil. And she crossed out the spade. So they marked her down because she should have crossed out the daffodil. The daffodil, yes. Yeah. So they asked her in this study about intelligence why she crossed out the spade. And she said, oh, well, I thought I was supposed to cross out the daffodil, but it was such a pretty picture I didn't want to destroy it. Fantastic now, story. <laughs> I mean, who was really intelligent? Yes. And there was another lovely one. A little boy in the same study was, uh, was asked to cross out the odd one out again. And he was given the earth, the moon, a lemon, the sun. Obviously, they wanted him to cross out the lemon. Obviously. And he didn't. He crossed out the earth. And they said to him, why? And he said, well, it was the only blue one. Now so, that 
<laughs> demonstrating a phenomenal perception, yes. a massive spatial intelligence. Mm. But he was marked down because he didn't give the correct answer. Yes, but within his own categories, of course, it was completely accurate. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. And, and on mathematical intelligence, mm. again, you're talking about these traumas in mathematics. Mm. It's been found that children see mathematics as a colourful, spatial, beautiful world. Many children see numbers as special colours and shimmering objects and special shapes, and they play with them in this internal universe. And there's a marvellous little story <laughs> recently of um, Calvin and Hobbes. And Calvin is sitting in his little mathematics This class. is this cartoon strip? Yes, this is a mm. cartoon strip with this little boy who has a tiger. Yeah. And he's always daydreaming. And he daydreams about um, being Spaceman Spiff, about being a Superman, about being a Tyrannosaurus Rex. And most of his life is spent in this phenomenal creative world. And he's sitting in his boring little classroom. And he's doing this mathematics test. And the first question is 6 plus 5 equals question mark. And you see him look at this paper with a frown on his face. And suddenly he's Spaceman Spiff. And he's out there in intergalactic space in his super flying spaceship. And he enters Galaxy XNP Xenon. And he goes to the local star Galactica 7. And there is the giant Planet 6. And Spaceman Spiff latches with his super planet-catching lasso, this planet, and slowly, with the full power of his super spaceship, he pulls the planet six slowly from its orbit and, with his immaculate intelligence, aims it precisely at planet five. The planet begins to hurtle towards planet five and, just in the nick of time, as he always does, Super Spaceman Spiff unlatches himself from Planet 6 and watches it hurtle into Planet 5. Planet 6, being much bigger in mass volume and with this phenomenal velocity, smashes Planet 5 to smithereens as Spaceman Spiff watches from his position in space and from his super spaceship. And as, as this scene ends, suddenly you see him back in the classroom with the answer, 6 plus 5 equals 6. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the teacher, the, the teacher saying, you know, the time's up, the test finished. He's saying, what? I've only just finished the first question. <laughs> so what these three tests, the standard IQ tests, don't measure is the giant universe inside the mind that considers all the possible creative options to the answer. And that's, in fact, what intelligence should be measuring, which brings us to this fourth intelligence, the creative intelligence. Creative intelligence is the ability to use the imagination, to use colour, to use space and dimension, and to link things that are not normally linked. So, for example, when Isaac Newton was sitting around underneath the apple trees, he reportedly suddenly had the apple fall on his head. The link was apple, head, connection, new image, gravity. And that's the thing, because probably apples have fallen before. Precisely. But he made the connection. He made the new connection. This creative intelligence is the ability to make unusual connections. Archimedes kind of sinking into the bath, and he suddenly notices water rising, body going in, aha, new way of measuring volume of multifaceted objects. So creativity is this fourth intelligence and it's equally as important, if not more, than the standard first three. Then we come on to some new intelligences which are being realized to be, if not as important, even more important than some of the ones we've mentioned. And the fifth one is interpersonal intelligence. This is the ability of a brain to relate to all other brains. That includes the ability to relate to other people, and that means people of all different kinds of intelligence, different race, different age, different sex, as many different people as possible. The ability to connect with other intelligences and to communicate appropriately with them. Does that include animal intelligences as well as human? That does include animal as well. In fact, that the connection with animal intelligence comes into a later intelligence also. Mm -hmm. So interpersonal, the ability to get along with other people, not just getting along, but to interrelate on a kind of super intelligent level, to know what they're feeling, to know what they're meaning, to understand their perspectives, is a major intelligence. And Howard Gardner of Harvard University said he believes that this is perhaps the most important intelligence and the most complicated one. Because you think 
of what is required to understand the unbelievable complexity of many, many hundreds of thousands of other similar intelligences to your own. Very important. So that's number five. The sixth one is the intra personal intelligence, and that's the ability of the individual to understand him or herself. In other words, to almost be at peace with yourself, to know fundamentally who you are, to be satisfied with the way you fundamentally function, to have your life primarily under your own kind of control. Sounds a bit like talking to yourself. Yes, and it's talking to yourself intelligently. Mm. You know, not the kind of, oh, I'll never do this, no, I can't do so and so, no, I'm stupid and so on and so forth. But... uh, isn't it a beautiful day? And you know, I'm, my, my object for the day is, and uh, I'm going to do this, and I'm feeling content with myself, and if I'm not feeling content, here's what I'm going to do to solve it. People who are fundamentally within their own skin is the common way of putting that. Mm-hmm. And that's a very important intelligence. You can have a very high IQ and be totally miserable, depressed, melancholic, and suicidal much of the time. So this is a, an important intelligence that to get on with yourself. And part of the main reason for doing these tapes is to help people come more to terms with themselves and their own genius, which will automatically increase that intra-personal intelligence. It almost seems to me that if the intra-personal intelligence is clicking properly, it brings the others in its wake. Yes, it does. I mean, what is interesting about all these intelligences is that each one of them tends to support Mm -hmm. and help the others. Now, number seven is a really nice one, and this is the sensual intelligence. I hear cheers there. (laughs) Yes, indeed. And this is the ability of all the senses to function superbly. If you think about yourself, and I'm now speaking to everyone who's listening to this, if you think about yourself and imagine yourself suddenly with far more powerful eyesight, with an ability to hear sounds more distinctively and understand the differences between all kinds of sounds with an ability to smell nearly as well as some of the dogs do, with an ability to taste and distinguish the different textures, the different tastes of all the foods, of everything that enters your mouth, with an ability to be super sensitive tactilely, with an ability to understand the nature of your body and so on and so forth, that would raise all your other intelligences enormously. The ability of your senses to take in and process information is a prime, prime intelligence. It's like having more players on your team, isn't it? Yeah, actually, and it's like having more notes in your Mm, piano. Exactly. Um, And having more players on your team means you've got a much more powerful and much more flexible team with which to play. Mm. So very important intelligence, only really realised in the last few, few years. Yes, actually, if you think about it in reverse... And let's say that you're a person with, let's say, average or normal sensual perception. And then think about shutting things down, like shut down one ear, yes. shut down one eye, put a clothes peg on your nose, <laughs> yes, and try and function. And then reverse it and say, what if you are now already with one ear shut, one eye shut, and a clothes peg on the nose, and take them away, and how much more power there is. Yes, sudden explosion. Yes. And you can do the same with the two eyes already. In fact, one of the the, uh, geniuses we'll be talking about is Leonardo da Vinci. And one of his prime goals in his own life was to open up his eyes more, to open up his senses more. He actually said that one of the prime formula for developing a good brain was to open up the senses. He said, you must develop your senses. He said, most people walk around, they look without seeing, listen without hearing, eat without tasting, move without bodily awareness, talk without thinking. He said, basically, we're living in a fog, an intellectual cocoon, and we've got to get out of it. So these sensual intelligences are really important. So that's number seven. So we've now got verbal numerical engineering, creative interpersonal, intrapersonal, sensual, and that leads us into number eight, which is the bodily kinesthetic rhythmical intelligence. Now, we were talking earlier on about the thick jock. Everybody watches a soccer game. The athlete. Yeah, (laughs) precisely. And says, oh, yes, you know, thick jock. But you actually give a computer, the best computer on the planet, a football, and you place a football near a goal, and you say, by the way, computer, you've got to get that football all the way down the field and into the other goal. And as you are doing so, you have to consider between 11 and perhaps 20 other objects in space that may be trying to help you or take that thing away from you. 
and you've got to get it in the upper right-hand corner of the goal, and there's a person defending against you. The computer can't even move, and it can't even begin to calculate it. The first computer that gets to cross a road, or right, the man yeah. or woman who designs that program <laughs> yeah. will get a Nobel Prize. Yeah, precisely. In fact, coming back to the numerical intelligence, all these people who say, oh, well, I'd never be able to get a degree in mathematics. Virtually every single one of them has jaywalked. In other words, crossed a busy street, not at the traffic lights, but in the middle of it, where they weren't supposed to do. And what they've actually done in intelligence terms, mathematical terms, is turn to the right and observe perhaps 100 or 200 lever and pulley objects. We call them human beings, but in this mathematical formula, they're levers and pulleys moving in different directions. They've also observed giant objects weighing between half a ton and 10 to 25 tons moving at different velocities in different directions. In a second, they take in all of that and they calculate the probable way in which all of that will progress. As they turn to the left and take in all those lever and pulley objects and all those giant masses of stuff coming and going away and towards them. They predict the probable outcome of all that behavior. They then check that their calculations, permutations, and combinations on the right were correct. And then they run across the street, dancing in between bicycles, motorcycles, cars, lorries, everything, human beings. And they get to the other side of this plane and say, I can't do maths. Having just completed a post-Newtonian, post-Euclidean, post-Einsteinian, post-doctoral thesis in geometry, vectors, space, movement, mass, weight, volume, prediction, computation, the whole lot. So every day, every single brain is doing post-doctoral mathematics. And if they think they can't, they're wrong. It's simply that at some early stage, they got a wrong formula and then began to think for the rest of their lives. That they couldn't do it. Very interesting. And what you're saying, in fact, is that so much teaching, so much formal teaching is that. It's formalistic. Yes. It's to abstract principles, whereas, in fact, the real-life situation, the daily challenges of the planet of just living are what constitutes intelligence. Yeah, precisely. In fact, my, my formulation on that is that, that all the IQ tests are nothing as compared to the ultimate IQ test. And the ultimate IQ test is planet Earth. Every second of every day, every one of us is given staggering questions that we have to answer at infinitely fast speeds, and we do it all the time. Walking across the street, solving a little problem, keeping the heart and blood system going, walking through the woods, considering what kind of foods to eat, conversing, unbelievable acts of intelligence, verbal, numerical, engineering, spatial, everything you can think of, and we're doing it all the time. Everyone listening to this tape is inherently qualified as a genius. It's just that they've got to realise it. Yes, I mean, life is a constant second-by-second -second challenge. Yes, and as you solve right. each new challenge successfully, yeah. you're proving your own intelligence. Yeah, precisely. So everybody listening to this has actually kind of worked out how to listen to it. Mm. That alone a computer can't do. So they're already well ahead of the game. And the fact that they can listen is extraordinary, coming back to that sensory intelligence. Imagine what listening at this kind of speed to this kind of information actually means when you're understanding it. Again, no computer can even come, come close to that. So this bodily intelligence, number eight, is a very superior intelligence. And there is no such thing as a thick jock. That is an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms. The Greeks were correct, the Romans correct, when they said, mensana in corpore sano. In a healthy body, there'll be a healthy mind. With a healthy mind, there'll be a more healthy body. So bodily intelligence is intelligent. All those soccer players you see are really, really bright. And it's interesting, the little survey of where the word genius crops up most commonly at this moment in time on the planet, and it's in relation to athletics. Really? To sports. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're actually beginning to realize on an almost subconscious, paraconscious level that physical intelligence is a major intelligence. And it helps the others. As we said earlier, each one helps the others. But if you think back to the ancient Greeks, I mean, people like Aeschylus, Euripides and Sophocles, known for their tragedies, yes. poets, were actually athletes. That's right. That's right. Known in their youth as athletes. So one of the clues about genius is it's beginning to be revealed <laughs> and will continue to be so. So we've now had number eight, bodily, kinesthetic, rhythmical, poise, posture, balance, awareness of your body in space. Number nine... 
is spiritual intelligence. This one comes back to your earlier point about relationship with animals and so on. Mm -hmm. The spiritual intelligence relates to the harmony with which that individual lives in relation to the planet and in relation to other beings. Environmental. Yeah, it's environmental. In other words, the the awe at the universe, the love of humanity, the concern for animals, the passion in terms of being aware of the environment and one's interrelationships with it. So it's a more loving, more spiritual, more uh, gentle, not weak, but gentle and very strong intelligence. It has an enormous power within it. If you think of the people who are, are truly spiritual, they tend to have tremendous focus, uh, enormous and expansive ideas. It's bigness of mind on some level. And then number 10 is the intelligence of intelligences. It's called the genius quotient, which we're going to be exploring in detail in these tapes. And this is the combination of elements that go to make up genius. And one of the games and exercises in these tapes is to listen to the following 10 great geniuses and decide for yourself as you listen where their great strength in these multiple intelligences lay and to try to identify common themes of personality characteristics. Patterns emerging. Yeah, patterns of behaviour, patterns of personality, patterns of things that they did or were or developed within themselves to reach this peak of intellectual intelligence, which we call genius. So what I'd like to do now is get straight on in to the first of the ten geniuses. And what we'll do here is take them in chronological order, and you'll be able to see as we go through, A, those commonalities, those patterns, those similar maps as we develop, and B, the way in which some of them majorly influence some of the others. And as we talk about those, we'll uh, bring in many other geniuses as well. Right. Let's go. <laughs>